tongue Clear as could be Till the planes hit the buildings And changed history They stood for an hour Once the damage was done But then suddenly crumbled Ten seconds they were gone There were cascading projections of steel into dust Looked like explosions, but it was not discussed. So I turn off the TV and shut out the lights. It's all just illusion, right in front of my eyes. Well, I'm not scared. Sharing the truth About 9-11 Now building number 7 Dropped the cleanest of all Yet the world still knows nothing Of this amazing free fall There was no real reason It wasn't hit by Yet you can't see the flames You see cascading projections of steel into dust Looks like demolition but it's never discussed So I turn off the TV And shut out the lights It's all just illusion Right in front of my eyes Well, I'm not scared of dying We're all bound for heaven Just sharing the truth About 9-11 They say that the bigger the lie The more people believe And the deeper the fear more easily we are deceived Turn off the TV And I shut out the lies It's all just illusion They're right in front of my eyes Well, I'm not scared of dying We're all bound for heaven just sharing the truth About 9-11 Yes, I'm sharing the truth About 9-11 Okay, well, it's another episode of 9-11 was an inside job and other state crimes against democracy. Yeah, there's, there you go. <laughs> okay, well, uh, how did you like last week's show with David Chandler? That was a uh, a viral type of thing, it, it, at least from David Chandler's website, maybe not mine. But uh, yeah, he's uh, using that clip that we debuted last week as a, uh, a teaching aid on his trip down to Eugene this week. So you folks in Eugene are up for some good times with David Chandler down there. Okay, now, um, I wanted to talk about uh, Edward Snowden. Now, when he first came out as a whistleblower, I was really positive and thrilled that you know somebody did that. And you know, it was nice that most of the stuff that he talked about we've already talked about. But in the past, they just dismissed us and saying, "Oh, you're just tinfoil hat wearing conspiracy nuts." And the one good thing that the Edward Snowden leaks did for us was, you know, show that no, we were right. We're, we're historians. We're not conspiracy nuts. But there wasn't anything new that we didn't know about. I mean, you didn't see Edward Snowden release anything about 9/11. You didn't. 
You didn't see anything released that would bring down anybody in the power structure. You know, you have to kind of wonder what, what type of leaks are we going to see? And Greenwald hasn't shown us anything spectacular on his website yet. I've checked it. And, you know, he'd have to put out, what, 50 or 100 a day to publish all of them in a lifetime. I mean, you know, all of the documents he has. And yet he's just chugging along with virtually nothing. So uh, one of my favorite people is Webster Tarpley. And uh, if you don't know him, you might Google Webster Tarpley. He's one, one interesting thing is that every time Alex Jones has him on, they get into bitter arguments uh, because Webster Tarpley doesn't exactly see it the way Alex Jones does. And Alex Jones is a bit of a sensationalist, and that doesn't go over well with Webster Tarpley. He's a balance to Alex Jones's sensationalism. But together, they sometimes get the message right. But listen to what Webster Tarpley has to say about Edward Snowden. Britain's Channel 4 chose him to deliver their annual response to Queen Elizabeth's royal Christmas message. A child born today will grow up with no conception of privacy at all. They'll never know what it means to have a private moment to themselves, an unrecorded, unanalyzed thought. And that's a problem because privacy matters. Privacy is what allows us to determine who we are and who we want to be. It was the night before Christmas, and all through the house, uh, there was a widespread disgust about the interview with Edward Snowden, which became the headline story of the Washington Post. Tuesday, December 24th, headline story, big picture, the entire Washington Post above the fold, Edward Snowden, I already won. And there he is, unshaven, right? Is he imitating the old Arafat look? I don't know. Uh, I have already won, says the braggart Snowden. Well, uh, I quickly laid down a Twitter challenge to this faker. Dear Ed Snowden, if you are not a limited hangout, then please prove it by telling us something we do not know about a big covert operation of the CIA, of MI6, of the Israelis. Tell us about 9-11. Tell us about the Arab Spring. Tell us about the killing of Gaddafi. Tell us about the shipping of the death squads into Syria and their arming. Tell us about subversive operations involving Morsi of Egypt. Tell us something geopolitical, something big, something that matters. Uh, we're not going to hold our breaths on that one because he's had uh, plenty of time. Uh, even the Washington Post in the Wonk blog then responded, no, it's Snowden, you haven't won anything. There have been no significant substantive policy changes uh, as a result of your uh, revelations. The, uh, the Washington Post claims his leaks have fundamentally altered the U.S. government's relation with its citizens and the rest of the world. Yeah, that's like saying he changed the national or indeed international conversation. But we know that it's always changing. It goes from Honey Boo Boo to Miley Cyrus to Madonna to Lady Gaga and then on to the NSA, but then soon back to Honey Boo Boo or whatever it is, uh, or the, the Duck Dynasty or uh, various other uh, possible themes. Um, in the course of this uh, interview, what I found notable is that he seems to be sending some messages to those who may still be his masters. Uh, he wants to steer the conversation to surveillance, democracy, and his documents. Notice he says, remember, I didn't want to change society. That's what he says. He has no program of any changes. I didn't want to change society. This is, is this a revolutionary? You tell me. I wanted to give society a chance to determine if it should change itself. And you think that this is primarily or exclusively a matter of NSA 
surveillance. All I wanted was for the public to be able to have a say in how they are governed. And uh, again, this is a matter of phone tapping or reading the Internet. Uh, I don't know. I am skeptical. And again, I'm more and more skeptical because we're not getting anything. I'm by, my challenge to uh, Snowden would also be, give us something that will destroy the career of one big, odious U.S. politician. Do you have anything that will um, put paid to Hillary Clinton's presidential ambitions? Can you uh, expose one of the top libertarians or reactionary Republicans? Can you... Um, essentially go through any of this, right? Can you give us something we don't know about somebody in Britain? Can you bring down the uh, conservative government in Britain with GCHQ and all that? Or how about Netanyahu? He certainly must figure in some of these. So Snowden, please tell us something we don't know, because otherwise a lot of us figure that you are just another tentacle, just another limited hangout in this tiresome parade that goes back to Ellsberg and Assange and quite a few others. Remember the criteria. The uh, figure, the celebrated figure, uh, in this case the whistleblower, has a Damascus Road conversion. Remember in Ars Technica, this uh, magazine, uh, in January 2009, Snowden says those people should be shot in the testicles. That is to say, he's talking about Assange and other leakers, other people on Krypton or whatever it is, right? He's against them. He became an immediate media darling. He's got the London Guardian and the Washington Post with Barton Gelman in his corner. (laughs) This doesn't happen for people that are not um, favored by the establishment, please. I mean, how naive can we be? Uh, Other whistleblowers with more explosive and more specific Revelations are ignored by these same heroes of investigative journalism. We get nothing new, and I've gone through it. We get nothing big, nothing about 9-11, nothing that would blow the lid off the psychological control mechanisms. And, of course, this is being used to prepare new covert operations. As I've tried to point out, one of the things that, uh, that Snowden has done is to, uh, as, as uh, Van, Van Williams um confessed on television. He said the the termites really went to work on Obama's popularity back in June when the Snowden revelations came out. In other words, the relation of dupes and dupees, uh, dupers and dupes between Obama and his left liberal base, that went into crisis when Snowden was trotted out with his stories. And that, of course, is important because the Oligarchical establishment controls president in the first term by their need to get money for a second term. And when they're in the second term, as we've seen from Nixon to Reagan to Clinton, they control the president by keeping him on the defensive under scandal attack. That is the second term jinx. Well, let's let's compare him to uh, actual revolutionaries of the past, right? Um, you can compare it to the French Revolution, the Russian Revolution, the American Revolution, right? The real ones, right? The ones that actually created important institutional uh, changes, right? The American Civil War obviously counts as a second American Revolution, without which the modern world would be simply unthinkable. Um, In case of uh, the 20th century, right, we had this question of what groups in society could be the historical protagonist of revolution? And the Marxists came forward and said, well, it's the industrial working class. It's the proletariat. Uh, in the case of Snowden and company, it's the hackers. It's uh, essentially marginal people, autistic sociopaths sitting in front of screens, people like uh, like Assange. And um, if I'm... By some strange coincidence, we're now getting the 30th year, the 30th, 3 zero anniversary, and it's continuing, of the Chaos Communications Conference in Hamburg, Germany, uh, the most British of all German cities, of course. Uh, and there we have uh, Assange will be holding forth, and Glenn Greenwald, but they're going to be co-headlining 
that conference, I guess, in both cases by uh, webcam. So um, uh, this is um, a group that's been around, right? These are the hackers, right? These are the people who um, who act out, right? The Pirate Party, other spinoffs have been, been taken off of this. But again, what is revolutionary here? Um, let's go back to, uh, to Lenin, right? Lenin, certainly a revolutionary, whatever you think of his methods, and I could... I would criticize them a great deal. I think, uh, for example, Rosa Luxemburg's critique of Lenin has a lot of uh, merit, although it is also not not perfect. But Lenin had sloganized, right, everything. All power to the Soviets, peace, bread, land, a program that uh, was widely understandable in Russia at the time. Now, uh, if you wanted to boil down Assange and Snowden and Greenwald to a program, they would say, all power to the whistleblowers, transparency, privacy, and net neutrality. Yeah, all power to the whistleblowers, transparency, privacy, and net neutrality. Now, you can see what the problem is with that. We've got recent articles in the uh, Washington Post, even, about the digital divide. Even in the United States, there are lots of places that are still stuck with the obsolete dial-up internet. And uh, we've still got, I think we've still got a majority of people in the world who have never made a phone call, quite apart from having uh, computers. In other words, this is a class distinction. There's a bright line class divide between internet access and not. Right? This, uh, it's come up in Italy, uh, uh, among other things, because of the, the internet fetishism of the five-star movement of Beppe Grillo that much of southern Italy and the poorer parts of the entire country are completely left out. But uh, transparency, privacy, and net neutrality? Suppose you're a victim of this depression. Your food stamps have been cut and your unemployment has been cut. You're starving. You're going to be evicted from your home under a foreclosure. Your kids can't continue their education because you can't pay the student loans and you can't pay the increased tuition. Your wife is sick and you can't get medical care. And the revolutionary Snowden is going to come and say transparency, privacy, and net neutrality. You see here that um, Snowden is arguing that the essence of the human personality, in other words, the epiphany of who you are is manifested in privacy. And I will say that is simply wrong. That is that is monstrously wrong. It is not in privacy that you show who you are. It is in revolutionary praxis. Who is strong? Who is good? This is not found in contemplating your own privacy. This involves going in public, going into the marketplace of ideas, going into the blood and sand of the arena, and if necessary, going onto the political battlefield, whatever that may look like. That is where the true worth or lack of it of an individual is manifested. So what you see here is it's a petty bourgeois class-based program, if you want to call it that, and it takes you away. It takes you in the opposite direction from what is needed, because what is needed is revolutionary mass action. To take a series of demands, the Wall Street sales tax, the nationalization of the Fed, the 30 million jobs, we'll have something to say about uh, a protective tariff. We want to add a protective tariff to that also to try to show uh, organized labor, that uh, it is not enough to say no to the Trans-Pacific Partnership, but it's going to be necessary to say 15% protective tariff, so we don't have to compete with sweatshop labor across the world, right? It's a way to raise the minimum wage across the world if you do this right. Uh, but no, Snowden, and I guess ex- by extension Assange, I suppose they're they're in friendly competition, the two of them as the two of the leading narcissists of the age, that they would come forward and say, no, uh, privacy 
is the essence. Well, that, by definition, atomizes everybody, locks you into your own alienated private sphere. The whole point of, of revolutionary action is to get you out of your alienated private sphere and into that area of uh, revolutionary praxis, or practice, whichever you like. As the mass upsurge of 2015 approaches, by the time we're into 2014, we're going to see the harbingers of that mass upsurge all over the place. This year already, 2013, we've seen Brazil, we've seen Turkey, we've seen Egypt, uh, we've seen mass strikes all across southern Europe, mass strikes against austerity. So these are the first rumblings. Okay, well, he started to break it down. Now, he, he can go on for hours and tell you about it. In fact, uh, about two or three years ago, he came out with the, uh, the plan to come out of the Bush Depression. And, of course, nobody listened to him. But if he had, we'd be in good stead right now. Uh, you know, you have to realize that our representatives and senators are millionaires. None of, nobody I know is a millionaire. I don't believe that millionaires kind of understand how it is to have your water or power or whatever shut off on a, you know, every other month type of basis like people like myself have happened. Uh, I don't believe that they're working for our interests whatsoever. In fact, you can see that in the form of what, I mean, in this Orwellian doublespeak language that we have, I mean, we call it the Defense Department, right? Have you ever seen them defend us against anything? Or is it just that we use our might to go around securing the wealth and resources of other countries for our corporations? And we call it a defense department, okay? Well, it's Orwellian. They, <laughs> they call it foreign aid. And what that really is, is bribery. It's economic bribery, bribing the rich officials of different countries to turn over the natural resources that we want or to vote in our favor so that we can get the natural resources that we want for our corporations. Now, did any of that benefit you or, or me? No. Well, we've got another role in here. This is the NSA and 9-11. And, you know, it's so intricate what's going on. There's so many different facets but basically we're not being served. As the public finally becomes outraged over the NSA's illegal spying, members of government and the corporate media wage an information war to misdirect that anger to issues of less importance. To counteract this, a bold new citizen-led initiative to nullify the NSA is now gaining momentum around the United States. This is the GRTV Backgrounder on Global Research TV. One of the less remembered parts of the Osama bin Laden fairy tale was that the NSA had a hard time keeping track of his communications with his al-CIA operatives. Why? Because, as General Michael Hayden told CBS News back in early 2001, bin Laden used standard encryption and off-the-shelf American telecommunication products. In the wake of the attacks, Osama bin Laden has emerged as the prime suspect. Bin Laden has long been one of NSA's main targets, but Hayden says he's a hard man to keep track of because he has access to the latest and best communications equipment made right here in the U.S. and available to anyone who can afford it. Can't comment specifically on who's doing what, mm. uh, but, but I can say uh, that people who would do harm to us are using encrypted products and services. But I think people have a hard time understanding why if during the Cold War you could stay either even or a step ahead of the big bad Soviet Union with all of its might, why you can't stay a step ahead of Osama bin Laden? Several reasons. One is the Soviet Union for its telecommunications had to rely on those things the Soviet Union built. Osama bin Laden has at his disposal the wealth, 
of a three trillion dollar a year telecommunications industry that he can rely on. He has better technology? That's one. He has better technology available to him. I can't get into operational details about what it is we know or don't know about him. Requires more on your part and you're behind the curve. We're behind the curve in keeping up with the global telecommunications revolution. Yes, we are. And that's the challenge we have. Sound unbelievable? That's because it is. As they go on to admit in that very same report, they were tracking bin Laden's satellite phone after all, and as James Bamford and others have described it in exhaustive detail, the NSA was monitoring al-Qaeda's communications hub in Yemen for years prior to 9-11, and purposefully withholding most of that information from the CIA bin Laden unit. But the idea that the NSA just wasn't able to track bin Laden because of his dastardly technology was a key meme for the NSA to implant in the immediate wake of 9-11. That's why the Hayden interview was replayed on CBS less than 48 hours after the attacks, and that's why, as recently declassified documents show, the NSA used 9-11 as an official talking point to justify their illegal surveillance of Americans. This meme, of course, was a lie. As NSA insiders have pointed out for years, most, if not all, of the current illegal collections programs began before 9-11, but the false flag events of September 11th provided the perfect justification for the revelation and expansion of those programs. I would hear the following phrase, which I think one person in particular probably had regrets ever saying more publicly, that 9-11 was a gift NSA. (laughs) A gift. Now, over a decade later, that meme is paying off. Just two weeks after a federal district court judge ruled the NSA's collection of telephone metadata unconstitutional, a different district court judge ruled it constitutional. In his particularly florid ruling, U.S. District Court Judge William Pauley wrote, The September 11th terrorist attacks revealed, in the starkest terms, just how dangerous and interconnected the world is. While Americans depended on technology for the convenience of modernity, Al-Qaeda plotted in a 7th century milieu to use that technology against us. It was a bold jujitsu, and it succeeded because conventional intelligence gathering could not detect diffuse filaments connecting Al-Qaeda. No matter if it bears any resemblance to reality, the meme has been planted and the courts are going along with it. It is now official lore that the NSA needs to spy on everyone's phone metadata to prevent the next 9-11 from taking place. Of course, that's not the only lie in this story. The even bigger lie that is being propounded now is that the national conversation and the court cases are still revolving around the false notion that NSA phone spying is somehow limited to metadata, as if all the NSA is collecting are lists of phone numbers and call durations. We have suspected for years that phone calls were being recorded and stored wholesale, but that was actually confirmed by Tim Clemente, a former FBI counterterrorism agent who casually let it slip on Aaron Burnett's CNN program in May that U.S. intelligence agencies have access to complete phone conversations whenever they want in the name of national security. Now, obviously, it was a voicemail. They could, they could try to get the, the phone companies to give that up at this point. But if it's not a voicemail, it's just a conversation. There's no way they actually can find out what happened, right? Unless she tells them. No, there is a way. They, we certainly have ways in, in national security investigations to find out exactly what was said in that conversation. Um, it's not necessarily something that the FBI is going to want to present in court, but it may help lead the investigation and or lead the questioning of her. So somewhere so we can it's certainly being find digitized or they can actually get that. Because everyone, people were saying, look, yeah, that wouldn't be well, possible. Yes. It's pretty incredible what you're saying. No, welcome welcome to America. The, uh, there, all of that stuff is being captured as we speak, whether we know it or like it or not. Although this caused a buzz at the time and was picked up by numerous publications, it was soon covered over by the Snowden story, which once again focused people's attention on metadata. One person who did not gloss over it, however, was Russ Tice. He is a former NSA employee who became a whistleblower almost a decade ago as one of the sources for the initial New York Times story exposing the illegal NSA wiretapping program. When he heard Clemente's interview, he immediately contacted his ex-NSA friends and discussed whether the NSA was already recording every phone conversation they could intercept and storing them at their new Utah data center. The ex-NSA gathering's consensus? This was exactly what the NSA was doing. As a result, Tice decided to go further than ever before about what he knew regarding illegal NSA activities. In a series of interviews on BoilingFrogsPost.com, The Corbett Report, and other media venues, Tice revealed that during his time as an NSA employee, he had personally handled the eavesdropping orders to monitor the communications of high-ranking judges, congressmen, and military officials, presumably for the purposes of blackmail. 
Uh, initially, what I saw was uh, they were targeting news organizations. They were char targeting targeting U.S. companies that did international business. They were charging, uh, looking at financial institutions, but they were also going after. Um, the State Department and uh, Secretary of State Colin Powell at the time, and they were going after high-ranking military generals, and that was just with my space capabilities that I saw. Now later, when I got together with colleagues, and we started to put together the terrestrial side, that's the side that is being done with all those nodes all over the country with the fiber optics and that sort of thing, then we found out that it got much worse. Because, and this was just the phone that we were looking at, but it was also being done at the email level, but, but that wasn't the information I was getting. The information I was seeing were phone numbers that were being plugged into a system that was going after uh, people's phone, uh, phone numbers and associated numbers, and a lot of, a lot of numbers I wasn't even sure, but they went after, they went after law firms and lawyers. They went after um, more generals. Uh, General Petraeus was one of the guys. It seemed like right about that three-star level was they were going after admirals and generals. They went after the Supreme Court, of which I held uh, Judge Alito's paperwork in my hand, numbers associated with Judge Alito that someone had put into the system that NSA used to spy on Judge Alito. And let's just break this down a little bit because these are explosive allegations right now that I have not heard anyone talk about before, that there are actually orders that you personally saw in your hands to wiretap Judge Alito, high-ranking intelligence officers, David Petraeus, Barack Obama. Wannabe Senator Barack Obama. At that time, he wasn't even a senator. He, he um, had won his primary in Illinois. And I think maybe the catalyst, and I don't, I'm not sure, was the fact that he had just done a big speech at the Democratic uh, Convention. Now, now I, I was at that time a lifelong Republican. I didn't even watch the Democratic Re Convention. So at the time, it, you know, the significance of it really didn't hit me until later. I mean, I did look up, well, who's this guy, Barack Obama? Well, okay, he made a speech, blah, blah, blah. But then, of course, later, things, you know, started to, you know, come into play that this is our future president of the United States. And once again, these shocking revelations are being spun away into theory and hearsay. This time, it's Senator Bernie Sanders lobbing the softball at the NSA, as he sends them a letter politely asking whether the NSA is spying on Congress. Senator Sanders did not ask about the wiretapping of communications that Tice has already exposed, however, but merely whether or not the NSA metadata spying extends to members of Congress. Once again, the real scandal is papered over by milquetoast non-confrontation by the bought-and-paid-for Congress that have been perfectly content to let this happen for years now. The entire NSA fiasco is stage-managed theatrics from start to finish, a carefully choreographed stage show with full cooperation from the corporate media that is only too willing to play along and misdirect the national conversation to areas of little or no importance. Meanwhile, in reality, the only question worth discussing is how to abolish the NSA entirely. Since this is not a question that is on the table politically, it is up to the public to find alternative ways of shutting down the NSA. Luckily, there is at least one innovative project happening that proposes to do just that. Fact. The new NSA data center in Utah requires 1.7 million gallons of water every single day to operate. Billions of Fourth Amendment violations need massive computers and the water to cool them. That water is being supplied by the state of Utah. Fact. There's absolutely nothing in the Constitution which requires your state to help the feds violate your rights. Our message to Utah? Turn it off. Well, in the broadest sense, the Off Now campaign is a state and local initiative to push back against NSA spying. We do not have any faith in Congress or the president or the federal courts to actually do anything to rein in the NSA spy machine. Uh, they may pretend like they do. They may pass some bills, but they're not really going to do anything that's going to be of any use. So we've decided we need to take a different approach. We want to harness the power of our state and local governments to 
create obstructions and make it as difficult as we can for the NSA to continue this unconstitutional and, and immoral spying on virtually everybody in the world. And so one of the main aspects of the campaign, probably the central aspect right now, is the Fourth Amendment Protection Act. And it's a piece of legislation that we are introducing at the state level. And essentially, it does four things. I'll run through them really quick and in a bullet-pointed uh, way to make things easy to understand. The first thing it does is it denies material support from the state to the NSA. So essentially, anything that the NSA gets from the state, they won't get it anymore. And this could be very significant in some places. For instance, Utah, they use 1.7 million gallons of water a day to cool their spy computers in the uh, Bluffdale Data Center. That water is actually supplied by a utility that's owned by the city of Bluffdale, which is a subdivision of the state of Utah. With this bill, it will make it possible to take steps to turn that water off and force the NSA to find water someplace else. So this can be extremely significant in states that actually have NSA facilities. We'd also deal with public utilities that supply electricity and things that we probably haven't even imagined yet. The second thing it does, and I really think this is the most significant part of the bill, at least in the short term, is that it prohibits any data that has been gathered by the NSA without a warrant that is shared with state and local law enforcement. It makes it inadmissible in state courts. We know that the NSA is sharing this data. We know that very little of it actually has anything to do with quote unquote national security. It's for basic law enforcement purposes. So this would basically say, you can share this data all you want to, but it's gonna be useless to state and local law enforcement in court. And it will kind of take that dagger out of the heart of the Fourth Amendment that this kind of information sharing shoves in there. A third aspect that it does is we have 166 universities in the United States that have partnerships with the NSA. They call them Centers for Academic Excellence, which I think is a, a nice Orwellian term suitable for this uh, particular subject. This bill would deal with state and public universities and force them to leave these relationships and keep any other state universities from entering into them. And then finally, it deals with corporations that do business with the NSA. And essentially, it's a disincentive to these corporations. Basically, the bill says, Corporation XYZ, if you're going to do business with the NSA, then we're going to prohibit you from having any state or local contracts and take that business away from you. So hopefully, it will create some disincentives. So this is the basic gist of the, uh, the legislation that we're working to get passed. Those who are interested in finding out how they can help to turn the taps off on the NSA, literally, are encouraged to explore the Nullify NSA hashtag on Twitter and the campaign website at offnow.org. For more on this story and other breaking news and current events, please go to globalresearch.ca. For more research and analysis by James Corbett, please go to corbettreport.com. All right, I really love James Corbett's analysis. He's usually spot on. Um, but... You know, I was thinking of one thing when they were telling you about the, uh, you know, the bill that would allow any information shared by the NSA without a warrant to not be used in court legally. But right, they're doing that right now. I mean, they're sharing this information and the uh, agencies that use the information know that they can't use it in court already. And so what they do is they cheat the system they they use that to to say oh here's a perpetrator let's go follow up on it and they gather other information and then use that other information as probable cause to do the arrest so they 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 cheat and lie anyway so you have to be a little bit more specific in that law no you don't get to share it without a warrant at all period you know not not just go ahead and share it and don't use it but anyway what it boils down to is you know, every bit of this system is, gear, is, is geared towards making money. Did you ever notice that no decision ever gets made by our Congress unless it involves selling weapons? I mean, it doesn't, I mean, why are we in the Middle East fighting anybody? We don't have any treaties with, the, with Israel, for instance. We don't, I mean, that's deliberate. Israel doesn't want to be bound to anything we have to say. Uh, but the point is, we don't, we don't have any obligation in the Middle East, so what are we doing there? I mean, the, the idea that keeps trying, you know, they try to sell us with the idea, oh, those poor people, we've got to protect them from some oppressive government. They never mention that the most oppressive government in the world is ours. But on and on, it, let's just say 
you've got to use a little bit of your brain power and realize that when they tell you that we're going around the world to save somebody, they're lying. And when they tell you that we're the force for good and truth and justice around the world, they're lying. It's as simple as that. Well, we're heading towards World War III, or at least that's what some people think. And that's a perfect lead in for our last video here. And then I'll be back to talk to you just before we sign off. So take it away, World War III. Why did the United States attack Libya, Iraq, Afghanistan, and Yemen? Why are US operatives helping to destabilize Syria? And why is the United States government so intent on taking down Iran, in spite of the fact that Iran has not attacked any country since 1798? And what's next? What are we headed for? When you look at the current trajectory that we're on, it doesn't make any sense at all if you evaluate it based on what we're taught in school. And it doesn't make any sense if you base your worldview on the propaganda that the mainstream media tries to pass off as news. But it makes perfect sense once you know the real motives of the powers that be. In order to understand those motives, we first have to take a look at history. In 1945, the Bretton Woods Agreement established the dollar as the world reserve currency, which meant that international commodities were priced in dollars. The agreement, which gave the United States a distinct financial advantage, was made under the condition that those dollars would remain redeemable for gold at a consistent rate of $35 per ounce. The United States promised not to print very much money, but this was on the honor system, because the Federal Reserve refused to allow any audits or supervision of its printing presses. In the years leading up to 1970, expenditures in the Vietnam War made it clear to many countries that the U.S. was printing far more money than it had in gold. And in response, they began to ask for their gold back. This, of course, set off a rapid decline in the value of the dollar. The situation climaxed in 1971 when France attempted to withdraw its gold and Nixon refused. On August 15th, he made the following announcement. I have directed the Secretary of the Treasury to take the action necessary to defend the dollar against the speculators. I have directed Secretary Connolly to suspend temporarily the convertibility of the dollar into gold or other reserve assets, except in amounts and conditions determined to be in the interest of monetary stability and in the best interest of the United States. The United States. This was obviously not a temporary suspension, as he claimed, but rather a permanent default. And for the rest of the world who had entrusted the United States with their gold, it was outright theft. In 1973, President Nixon asked King Faisal of Saudi Arabia to accept only U.S. dollars as payment for oil and to invest any excess profits in U.S. Treasury bonds, notes, and bills. In return, Nixon offered military protection for Saudi oil fields. The same offer was extended to each of the world's key oil-producing countries, and by 1975, every member of OPEC had agreed to only sell their oil in U.S. dollars. The act of moving the dollar off of gold and tying it to foreign oil instantly forced every oil-importing country in the world to start maintaining a constant supply of Federal Reserve paper. And in order to get that paper, they would have to send real physical goods to America. This was the birth of the petrodollar. Paper went out, everything America needed came in, and the United States got very, very rich as a result. It was the largest financial con in recorded history. The arms race of the Cold War was a game of poker. Military expenditures were the chips, and the US had an endless supply of chips. With the petrodollar under its belt, it was able to raise the stakes higher and higher outspending every other country on the planet, until eventually U.S. military expenditures surpassed that of all other nations in the world combined. The Soviet Union never had a chance. The collapse of the communist bloc in 1991 removed the last counterbalance to American military might. The United States was now an undisputed superpower with no rival. Many hoped that this would mark the beginning of a new era of peace and stability. Unfortunately, there were those in high places who had other ideas. Within that same year, the U.S. invaded Iraq in the first Gulf War. And after crushing the Iraqi military and destroying their infrastructure, including water purification plants and hospitals, crippling sanctions were imposed which prevented that infrastructure from being rebuilt. These sanctions, which were initiated by Bush Sr. and sustained throughout the entire Clinton administration, lasted for over a decade and were estimated to have killed over 500,000 children. The Clinton administration was fully aware of these figures. We have heard for the 
half a million children have died. I mean, that's more children than died when, when, in, in Hiroshima. And, and, you know, is the price worth it? I think this is a very hard choice, but the price, we think the price is worth it. Worth it, worth it. Ms. Albright, what exactly was it that was worth killing 500,000 kids for? In November of 2000, Iraq began selling its oil exclusively in euros. This was a direct attack on the dollar and on U.S. financial dominance, and it wasn't going to be tolerated. In response, the U.S. government, with the assistance of the mainstream media, began to build up a massive propaganda campaign claiming that Iraq had weapons of mass destruction and was planning to use them. In 2003, the U.S. invaded, and once they had control of the country, oil sales were immediately switched back to dollars. This is particularly notable due to the fact that switching back to the dollar meant a 15 to 20 percent loss in revenue due to the euro's higher value. It doesn't make any sense at all unless you take the petrodollar into account. So I came back to see him a few weeks later, and by that time we were bombing in Afghanistan. I said, are we still going to war with Iraq? And he said, oh, it's worse than that. He said, he reached over on his desk, he picked up a piece of paper, he said, I just... He said, I just got this down from upstairs, meaning the Secretary of Defense office today, and he said, this is a memo that describes how we're going to take out seven countries in five years, starting with Iraq and then Syria, Lebanon, Libya, Somalia, Sudan, and finishing off Iran. 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 Let's take a look at the events of the past decade and see if you see a pattern. In Libya, Gaddafi was in the process of organizing a block of African countries to create a gold-based currency called the dinar which they intended to use to replace the dollar in that region. U.S. and NATO forces helped destabilize and topple the Libyan government in 2011, and after taking control of the region, U.S. armed rebels executed Gaddafi in cold blood and immediately set up the Libyan Central Bank. Iran has been actively campaigning to pull oil sales off of the dollar for some time now, and it has recently secured agreements to begin trading its oil in exchange for gold. In response, the U.S. government, with mainstream media assistance, has been attempting to build international support for military strikes on the pretext of preventing Iran from building a nuclear weapon. In the meantime, they established sanctions which U.S. officials openly admit are aimed at causing a collapse of the Iranian economy. Syria is Iran's closest ally, and they are bound by mutual defense agreements. The country is currently in the process of being destabilized with covert assistance from NATO. And though Russia and China have warned the United States not to get involved, the White House has made statements within the past month indicating that they are considering military intervention. It should be clear that military intervention in Syria and Iran isn't being considered. It's a foregone conclusion, just as it was in Iraq and Libya. The U.S. is actively working to create the context which gives them the diplomatic cover to do what they already have planned. The motive for these invasions and covert actions becomes clear when we look at them in their full context and connect the dots. Those who control the United States understand that even if a few countries begin to sell their oil in another currency, it will set off a chain reaction and the dollar will collapse. They understand that there is absolutely nothing else holding up the value of the dollar at this point, and so does the rest of the world. But rather than accepting the fact that the dollar is nearing the end of its lifespan, the powers that be have made a calculated gambit. They have decided to use the brute force of the U.S. military to crush each and every resistant state in the Middle East and Africa. That in itself would be bad enough, but what you need to understand is that this is not going to end with Iran. China and Russia have stated publicly and on no uncertain terms that they will not tolerate an attack on Iran or Syria. Iran is one of their key allies, one of the last independent oil producers in the region. And they understand that if Iran falls, then they will have no way to escape the dollar without going to war. And yet the United States is pushing forward in spite of the warnings. What we are witnessing here is a trajectory that leads straight to the unthinkable. It's a trajectory that was mapped out years ago in full awareness of the human consequences. But who was it that put us on this course? What kind of psychopath is willing to intentionally set off a global conflict that will lead to millions of deaths just to protect the value of a paper currency? It obviously isn't the president. The decision to invade Libya, Syria, and Iran was made long before Obama had risen to the national spotlight. And yet, he's carrying out his duty just like the puppets that preceded him. So who is it that pulls the strings? Often the best answer to questions like this are found by asking another question. Qui bono? Who benefits? Obviously those who have the power to print the dollar out of thin air have the most to lose if the dollar were to fall. And since 1913, that power has been held by the Federal Reserve. 
The Federal Reserve is a private entity owned by a conglomerate of the most powerful banks in the world. And the men who control those banks are the ones who pull the strings. To them, this is just a game. Your life and the lives of those you love are just pawns on their chessboard. And like a spoiled four-year-old who tips the board onto the floor when they start to lose, the powers that be are willing to start World War III to keep control of the global financial system. Remember that when these wars extend and accelerate. Remember that when your son or your neighbor's son comes back home in a flag-draped coffin. Remember that when they point the finger at the new boogeyman. Because the madmen who are running this show will take this as far as you allow them to. So how much time do we have left? It's a question I hear constantly, but it's the wrong question. Asking how much time we have left is a passive posture. It's the attitude of a prisoner who's waiting to be taken out to a ditch and shot in the back of the head. What are our chances? Can we change course? Also the wrong question. The odds don't matter anymore. If you understand what we're facing, then you have a moral responsibility to do everything in your power to alter the course that we're on, regardless of the odds. It's only when you stop basing your involvement on the chances of success, that success actually becomes possible. To strip the ill-begotten power from the financial elites and to bring these criminal cartels to justice will require nothing less than a revolution. The government is not going to save us. The government is completely infiltrated and corrupts the core. Looking to them for a solution at this point is utterly naive. There are three stages of revolution, and they are sequential. Stage one is already underway. Stage one is the ideological resistance. In this stage, we have to actively work to wake up as many people as possible about what is happening and the direction we're headed. All revolutions originate from a shift in the mindset of the population, and no other meaningful resistance is possible without it. Success in this stage of the game can be measured by the contagion of ideas. When an idea reaches critical mass, it begins to spread on its own and seeps into all levels of society. In order to achieve that contagion, we need more people in this fight. We need more people speaking out, making videos, writing articles, getting this information onto the national and international stage. And we especially need to reach the police and the military. Stage two is civil disobedience, also known as nonviolent resistance. In this stage, you put your money where your mouth is, or more accurately, you withhold your money and your obedience from the government. And you do everything in your power to bring the gears of the state to a halt. Practiced in mass, this method alone is often enough to bring a regime to its knees. However, if you fail at this stage, stage three is inevitable. Stage three is direct physical resistance. Direct physical resistance is the last resort and it should be avoided and delayed as long as possible. And it should only be invoked after all other options have been thoroughly exhausted. There are those who talk tough and claim that they will resist when the time comes. But what those people fail to realize is that if you are inactive during the first two stages and save your efforts for the last resistance, then you will fail. When the Nazis were moving door to door, dragging people out of their homes in Germany, that was the time to fight back physically. But due to the lack of ideological resistance and civil disobedience leading up to that moment, even an armed uprising would have likely failed at that point. An armed uprising can only succeed if the people have established an attitude of active resistance. And active resistance is only possible after their minds have broken free from the mainstream propaganda. If you want to fight back, it's now or never. You're not going to get another chance, and the stakes are far higher than they were in Nazi Germany. Okay, I, I hope you're making notes of the uh, sources of these videos because, you know, I can't possibly show you all the good stuff out there, but I can kind of point you in a direction maybe that you haven't seen or thought of before. Uh, you know, and if you have other ideas, be sure to let me know. And by the way, uh, you've seen me wearing the Alex Jones 9-11 t-shirt, and you've seen me wearing the uh, Richard Gage um uh, architects and engineers for 9-11 truth t-shirt but you haven't seen this one too much ta-da I just freaked out my sound man probably but this is the uh, PDX 9-11 uh, alliance right here in Portland and uh, I was going to say that if you have a t-shirt a 9-11 t-shirt and you'd like to get it on the air just get it to me somehow I take large or extra large and every 
you know, any t-shirt you send me, I'll put on the air, even if it's uh, not exactly in my viewpoint, but I'll at least give you that fair airing. I don't think that violates any of those rules with uh, cable access. I'm not, I'm not trying to make a big profit or anything. I'm, I'm just offering to put stuff on the air. Um, anyway, what, as, as you saw from that last clip, you know, that was kind of a doomsday thing. And from my point of view, I mean, I'm an old guy. And no matter what happens, you know, things aren't going to change too much before I kick off. So, you know, I'm not, I don't have a lot to be worried about exactly. I don't have any children. But most of you folks out there do. And, you know, it's up to you. Do you just want to sit there on the couch going, meh, meh, every time you watch Channel 8, Channel 6, Channel 2, or even PBS, you know, Channel 10, Channel 12, it's Fox, of course. F Fo they always spell that wrong, it's F-A-U-X. But anyway, it, it's just like <laughs> American Idol, they always spell that wrong, it's supposed to be I-D-L-E. But, well, anyway, back to it. What I, you know, what I want to do is take pictures. Now, I've got a lot of stuff going that I'm showing elsewhere, you know, like I have pictures set to music shown here on cable access. It's also on my YouTube channel. And I'd rather be out taking pictures than, than studying 9-11. This is season seven, episode eight. I mean, seven years of this. What's it gonna take, folks, to begin to realize, I mean, everything we've said about 9-11 has been held up by evidence and, um, you know, supported by, all kinds of facts. It's 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 a shame that so many Americans still don't get on board with the idea that 9/11 was an inside job, but maybe it's that language that's that's really stopping us because it was an outside job too, an inside and an outside job. Now I used the inside job rhetoric to to be a shock rhetoric, but now after all this time, I think it turns people away. I think I'd probably be better off. Uh, well, you know, here the free speech zone. Uh, that's a better name for a show probably. P people need to understand, you know, the terrorists, so-called terrorists, were organized abroad. They were organized by U.S. forces. You know, don't, don't mistake it when I say, you know, outside job too. It was an outside job outside of the United States, but it was paid for by forces within the United States and probably elsewhere. The, the global elite paid for this. Um, Kevin Ryan's book, uh, 19 Suspects That We Ought to Be Looking Into, I, I'm, I probably got the title wrong, but Kevin Ryan, and look, look up 19, you can't go wrong. That, that book really points the finger at, you know, who did it. But that ducks the question, you know, are you going to keep accepting the idea that foreign aid really aids foreigners? Are you going to keep accepting the idea that we have to keep giving that money or the world's economy will collapse? Forget about it. It's an artificial support. It's not really supporting anything in any good way. So, well, we got 30 seconds left. I'll be back next week. And, uh, you know, some of you folks were on the line last time for the David Chandler thing, didn't get to talk. Maybe you'll get to talk next time. We'll open up the phone lines. So have a good one.